Hey, listeners, before we get into the episode today, I wanted to ask you to do me a huge favor. I would love it if you'd go over and fill out a survey for me. It's at survey.libson.com forward slash history goes bump. That's survey.libsyn.com forward slash history goes bump. That's to help facilitate me getting sponsors for the show, which is going to help me keep history goes bump on the air. Thanks so much. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org to discover more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people. Welcome to this 282nd episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I am your host, Diane. The location we have on this episode was suggested by listener Katrina Ray Salas. We're heading over to Asia, and I'm excited about that because we don't get a whole lot of suggestions for Asia. And this one's a big one. How about the Great Wall of China? This is pretty much a bucket list thing for everybody in the world to come see, I'm sure. Definitely is for me. Apparently, a lot of people have died around this wall, and now we have a lot of spiritual activity going on as well. So I'm looking forward to bringing that to you guys. Before we do that, I want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Pat, Valerie, Carla with a C, Veronica, Lily with one L, Katrina, and Belinda. Welcome, everybody. And now, this moment, Naughty. The moment Naughty was suggested by Pat Clifford. Pat lives in Australia and wanted to share the local story about Sarah's grave. This grave belongs to Sarah Simpson and is located in an old bush cemetery at Castle Rigg, about an hour west of Sydney, Australia. Some of the first settlers in the region are buried in this graveyard. Sarah was a British convict who arrived in New South Wales in 1818 aboard the Friendship. Her crime was stealing some clothes that were valued at five pence. She served her time and was released and met a recently released convict named John Simpson, who was a tailor, and the couple moved out west. They had eight children together. On the evening of December 10, 1838, Sarah was walking home when a group of men attacked her and killed her. John was devastated when her battered body was found. They had not married, and so he married her in a graveside service to ensure she could pass on without sin into the next life. But it doesn't seem that Sarah passed on. Legends claim that she harasses young men that lurk near her graveside. Young women claim to have seen her ghost in the branches above her grave. An even weirder part of the legend claims that her father visited her grave and found her headstone destroyed. Each time he repaired it, he would return the next day to find it destroyed again. He decided to stay the night at the cemetery and watch for the culprit. He went to the bush to go to the bathroom, and when he came back, the headstone was destroyed. He was truly puzzled because he was not gone long enough for anyone to destroy the marker, and he'd heard no noise. And it is that part of the legend that certainly is odd. Rather than playing a fun little stinger right now in between the oddity and the history that I normally do, I'm going to play for you a trailer for the Lyft Anthology. For those of you who listen to the Lyft podcast, they have an anthology out with all new stories. And I've already read it, reviewed it, and it's really good. Let's go for a ride. There are many stories here. Like this place. Like many things here. Some have become lost. 
but all lost things yearn to be found, and all stories long to be told. I've searched through my building, gathering up stories from every floor, from the basement to the ninth story, and every floor in between. Stories of choice, of the hopeless, the redeemable, and the lost. Stories that will unlock something inside of you and carry you through fear to your future. Get your copy of the Lift's First Anthology on Amazon in print and Kindle. Let's go for a read. <laughs> And now, This Month in History. This Month in History was suggested by Johnny Marvin Allen. In the month of November on the 10th in 1973, David Stringbean Aikman and his wife Estelle were ambushed and murdered. Stringbean had started his legendary music career with a guitar he'd made out of a shoebox and a piece of thread. He got his nickname at a talent contest because he was lanky, and the MC yelled for the Stringbean to come to the stage. Soon Stringbean was picking his banjo in a band, but was eventually left behind because he was considered old-fashioned. He married Estelle and went on to continue playing his old-time music, doing comedy, and living a simple life. He also became a part of the Grand Ole Opry radio show and the cast of Hee Haw on television. That simple life also meant that he didn't trust banks. It was rumored that he kept a huge wad of cash in his bibbed overalls. A couple of lowlifes named Doug and John Brown would shatter the innocence of Nashville's small-town feel. They had heard about Stringbean keeping a stash of money, and they ransacked the cabin that Stringbean and Estelle shared. Stringbean knew something was wrong when they got home and pulled his pistol. It would do him no good as he took a bullet to the head the minute he entered the cabin. Estelle made a run for it, but she was shot too. Fellow Opry star Louis Marshall Grandpa Jones would find the bodies. The Brown cousins were arrested and convicted and sentenced to life behind bars. Doug died in prison, but John was eventually released after 41 years. Stringbean did have stashes of money in the cabin that the Browns never found. These stashes of money were later found in the walls. Visiting the Great Wall of China is a bucket list item for many people. This man-made structure runs west to east across northern China for 13,171 miles. Construction began with the first emperor of China over 2,000 years ago. Building would continue for centuries with most of the work being done during the Ming Dynasty, and actually, most of the original wall no longer exists. Thousands of people died while building the wall, and many died in battles near and on the wall. This much death seems to have led to paranormal activity. The wall is said to be the most haunted structure in China. There are many ghosts seen here. Join me as I explore the history and hauntings of the Great Wall of China. I'm going to apologize now. Obviously, we're going to have a lot of Chinese terms and names in this episode, and you know I'm going to end up butchering some of them, so sorry for that. I'm going to try my best. wall traverses 11 provinces and two autonomous regions. The structure began as the northern frontier wall and was initiated by the first emperor of China, Xinhua, in 221 BC. This would be the Qin dynasty and where China gets its name. But even before that, princes that headed up the various states in the country had built their own walls along state borders for protection. These were similar in style to the Great Wall and began as early as 650 BC. 
warlords eventually joined the individual states during the Warring States period, and seven large states were the result. So we're at this point in Chinese history where they've got these seven large states. And the Qin was the most powerful and conquered everybody else. That's why the first dynasty we're going to have here is the Qin dynasty. And this is spelled Q-I-N. In 221 BC, Emperor Hua began the construction on the Great Wall and the Grand Canal. He wanted the wall to protect against the harassment coming from the Mongols. This early work mainly joined together all the separate walls and took nine years with nearly a million workers. How do you get that many workers to work on a wall for you? Do you suppose that they all volunteered for the job? Nope, I don't know that any of them volunteered for the job. These were mainly convicts and unwilling conscripts. So we're already going to have an issue going on here with the wall. You've got a lot of people who didn't want to do this job to begin with being forced to do the labor. You can imagine that working conditions were not good or safe. So we're going to have a lot of deaths along the wall. This wall measured 3,100 miles and gave the Chinese no pride as they believed this wall did not unify and that people were just sent there to labor and die. And the reason why I wanted to point that out is a lot of people might think, well, by having this huge wall there and combining all of these states together, you're going to have this unified nation. And that was not the case. These people didn't like the fact that they had an emperor and they really didn't like the fact that all these people had been made to do the labor on this wall against their will. And for a lot of them, it was probably their family members. If you're talking a million workers, that's a lot of family members who went away to the wall and probably never came home. Now, while the Qin dynasty was very powerful and had conquered all these other states, it didn't last very long. As a matter of fact, it only lasted for 15 years and was replaced by the Han dynasty. Part of the problem you have when you put yourself in as emperor and you name the dynasty after yourself or your own state, when you die, who takes over? There's a weakness there, and that weakness gives somebody else the chance to come in and take over, and that's what we're going to have happen here. When Emperor Hua died, there were two powerful generals who tried to take control. They were Jing Yu of Chu and Liu Bang of Han. Liu Bang won, and the Han dynasty rose to power and continued construction on the wall. This emperor was the first to use the wall as a means of regulating trade along the Silk Road. The Han Dynasty Great Wall stretched from the North Korea coast near Pyongyang in the east to Jade Gate Pass in the west. This span included branching walls, natural barriers, and trenches. A special kind of building was adopted for this stage of the wall. Builders made basic wall frames by weaving together rose willow and reeds, and then they filled the frames with gravel. So I'm envisioning our modern-day rebar and concrete being put together to make walls. Very ingenious for the time. These were then piled in layers. High saline groundwater solidified the sand and gravel. There were three main types of construction. Yellow Gobi desert soil pressed in layers, sand and stones and rose willow, and hue poplar frames and reed adobe. Beacon towers were built every three miles and 80 of those still survive today. These towers were used as signal posts. Smoke and fire could be seen as far as 10 miles, so these were used by guards. The construction here is amazing, as this section of wall in the Gobi Desert has survived. So all of the elements and all of those years, and they still have this part of the wall there today. Feudal dynasties continued working on the wall through 1271 AD. The vast Mongol Empire managed to invade China and ushered in the Yuan Dynasty. This would unify Mongolia and China, and all work on the wall ceased, of course, because the reason why the wall was being built in the first place was to keep the Mongols out. So since they were in, wouldn't do much good to build a wall. This was China's first foreign-led dynasty, and the UN dynasty was founded by Genghis Khan. Fun fact, this was the first dynasty to use paper money, and Marco Polo visited China during this time. And some of you might have heard the name of the dynasty and thought, isn't that the name of the currency in China? So makes sense that their currency would be named for the first dynasty to use paper money to begin with, the UN. As tends to happen, this dynasty lost touch with its Mongol roots and internal turmoil was the result. Weakness also came via the Black Death and natural disasters. So the Mongols are in control. They're supposedly turning away from the way that they're supposed to be living. 
And you have all of these other things that are happening around them. The Black Death has come through Europe and now it's come over into Asia and it's killing thousands and thousands of people. You have all kinds of natural disasters going on, killing thousands of people as well. This weakness opened it up to defeat. The internal rebellion called itself the Red Turban Rebellion, and they blamed the government for the disasters. The final straw came when the Yellow River changed course and flooded a major region and ended up impoverishing the entire area. The Red Turban said that this happened because the empire had lost the mandate of heaven. And with that, we're going to jump down a little rabbit hole here. Hello? Hello? Yes, I'm down here in the rabbit hole and I've brought you with me. So when I heard this thing called the mandate of heaven, I wondered to myself, what is that exactly? It seems like it would almost be self-explanatory, but not quite. The mandate of heaven seems like it would be similar to the divine right of kings that we hear about in Europe, right? Sort of, kind of like that, as in God seems to be controlling the whole thing. And that's about where that ends. With the divine right of kings, a particular family was chosen, supposedly by God, to be leaders, and it was wrong for the people to rebel against them because your leadership had been chosen by God. So if you're rebelling against them, you're rebelling against God. When it came to the mandate of heaven, this allowed for people to rebel when they saw that favor had fallen from an emperor. So they believed that God would put an emperor in place. But if they started to see signs like famines and disasters and sickness coming through, that would be a sign to them that God doesn't like this guy anymore. So it was almost a requirement for them to begin a rebellion against that emperor to throw him out, because if he doesn't have God's favor anymore, you don't want him in charge. There are four principles to the mandate. Number one, heaven grants the emperor the right to rule. Two, since there's only one heaven, There can only be one emperor at any given time. Three, the emperor's virtue determines his right to rule. So you better not be screwing up. And number four, no one dynasty has a permanent right to rule. I actually could get on board with each and every one of those when it comes to government. And that was just a little bit about the mandate of heaven. Now let's find out more about this Red Turban Rebellion. Shu Yuangsang was an important leader of the Red Turban Rebellion, and he defeated all the other rival armies, destroyed the Yuan palaces, and established the Ming Dynasty. Most of the original wall does not exist today. What we see today was mostly built during the Ming Dynasty. So keep in mind, when I'm talking about original wall, I'm talking about going all the way back to when those states were building their border walls, and then those were all brought together and made one unified wall. That's the original wall. The Ming Dynasty lasted from 1368 to 1664 AD, so it had a long run. This undertaking was the most massive. The Ming Dynasty added over 25,000 massive watchtowers that ranged in height from 16 to 26 feet, 20 feet across the bottom and 16 feet across the top. So these watchtowers were huge. And not only that, 25,000 of them. The Ming Dynasty also enclosed their prized agricultural center, Liaoning Province, behind a walled fortification. This wall has been a source of controversy between China and North Korea, with North Korea claiming that this wall belongs to them and not China. This fight continues today. The Ming Dynasty had a long run, but there was some inner turmoil. Rebels turned against the Ming Dynasty, which at the time was headed by Emperor Wu Shengyu. He decided to ally himself with the Manchus and made an agreement with them that he would open the wall if they would help him defeat the rebels that he had inside the country. Dumb move as the Manchus seized power, expelled the Ming Dynasty, and established the Qing Dynasty that held power from 1644 to 1912 AD. The Great Wall would fall into neglect at this time. That's a long period of time, 1644 to 1912, with nobody working on it through all of that time. It's no wonder that it started to crumble and fall apart. In 1912, the Republic of China decided to use it for controlling immigration and emigration. As hard as it may be to believe, the Great Wall had no real efforts to maintain and preserve it until 1980. Can you believe that? All the way up until 1980, there really was no effort to take care of that wall. 
the Chinese government went, hmm, we could actually make some money with this, maybe. So let's protect that wall. They started to do restoration efforts. And then in 1987, it was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Even with these efforts, the wall has only around 600 miles that is actually stable. And so that's all you really can visit today. People come from all around the world to visit. And contrary to the popular belief out there that the Great Wall is the only man-made structure that can be seen from space... It actually cannot. So I'm sure many of you have heard that before. I know I have, that the Great Wall of China is the only man-made structure that can be seen from space. But apparently, that is just a legend. Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield spent five months aboard the International Space Station, and he tweeted, The Great Wall of China is not visible from orbit with the naked eye. It's too narrow, and it follows the natural contours and colors of the landscape. So where did this idea come from, you're probably asking. Many believe that this fallacy dates back to 1895, when English essayist Sir Henry Norman wrote that the wall was, quote, the only work of human hands on the globe visible from the moon, end quote. He made this observation based on the fact that people on Earth could see craters and canals on the moon. He reasoned that someone on the moon would be able to see something as long and massive as the Great Wall on Earth. Now, that may seem a little bit silly to us that something that was written back in 1895 is what caused us to believe that the Great Wall could be seen from space. But what I'm more amazed by is the fact that this guy in 1895 was even thinking about man being on the moon and looking back at the Earth. That's pretty cool. There are a handful of legends that are connected to the Great Wall, and I thought I would share a couple with you. A legend connected to the wall is about a fortress on the Great Wall originally named the Jinfeng Ku, or the Happy Meeting Fortress. This is how it got its name. The Great Wall required soldiers to be on guard all year round, and this caused much suffering for them and their families. A young soldier had gone to defend the northern territory of China along the Great Wall. He was gone for many years. He and his father were the only people that remained of their family, and his father came to find him. The two men almost didn't recognize each other because of all the years that had passed. When they recognized each other, they greeted each other with hugs and wept. Then they both died on the spot. The fortress was named in their honor. They represented the heart of thousands of soldiers and their families. The China Traveler's website reports, Jiu Fortress is the western end of the Great Wall of China. It's a huge fortress that marks the end and the beginning of the Great Wall. Beyond it lay the barren Gobi Desert in which nobody lived. Only travelers and traders risked their lives in passing the Great Fortress, and their lives depended on destiny. In ancient China, and perhaps in present day also, people had the habit of testing their luck, which they believed would predict the outcome of their travels. Travelers and traders had the custom of throwing stones on the walls of the Jiu Fortress. If the stone created noise, no matter loud or not, it would be a good sign that they would at least be safe out of the fortress. On the other hand, if no noise came about, they would probably be lost in the vast, unknown world and should never return. If the sign is good, they might make a fortune and, most importantly, return safe and sound. If the sign is a bad one, they might be hindered of their decision of venturing out. Such habit existed along the entire fortress there. So if you're ever visiting the Great Wall and you're near that fortress, throw a rock at it and see what happens. Of course, I don't know if they like people throwing rocks at it anymore, so you might get in trouble for doing it. Don't tell them I told you to do it. The Great Wall is visited by over 4 million people a year, and some of those visitors claim to experience things that they cannot explain. There are stories that at least a million people died during construction of the wall, And I actually read places that claimed 2 and 3 million people died. Now, I thought those numbers seemed a little high. 1 million sounded more plausible to me, so that's what I went with. But even 1 million, that's a huge amount of people to die along the wall. And I know we're talking centuries of time, but still. The most common experience is the holy grail of ghost hunting. And that, of course, is full-bodied apparitions. Most of these are seen as guards walking along the wall standing up in the watchtowers. That's generally what people end up seeing. Many tourists complain that they feel weird while visiting, and this quote-unquote weird entails nausea, headaches, feelings of uneasiness, and body pains. 
being the open-minded skeptic that I am, I'd want to test the area that they're in and see if there's some kind of mineral deposit or something else in that vicinity that might be making them feel ill rather than something spiritual. But we did have a lot of negativity going on around the wall, so it's definitely possible that it could be making people feel physically bad. Some people report being physically assaulted with punches, slaps, and that they're grabbed by things they cannot see. Local legend claims if you visit the Great Wall, the spirits of the fallen workers will haunt you until you cross a line of firecrackers to scare them away. So I don't know if he just put a little line of firecrackers down on part of the wall and then step over it, and that makes them think that they're in danger in some way, so they run away. I'm I'm not sure how that works, but probably shouldn't be walking around with firecrackers in your pocket anyway. Again, if you do so, don't tell them I told you to do that. Many of the ghost stories originate from one area of the wall that is north of Beijing and known as the Wild Wall. Even worse than stories of hauntings, is the fact that several hikers have died along this portion of the wall via lightning strikes and falls. I don't know if it is just a higher part of the wall, and that's why there's more lightning strikes. I don't know if it's not as well constructed, and that's why we have more falls. Or is this really a bad section of wall, you know, with bad juju? Disembodied marching footsteps are heard in this area of the wall, and strange apparitions have been seen. And this part of the wall, the wild wall, is so notorious that Destination Truth visited it during Season 3, Episode 11, back in 2010. They did some ghost hunting there, and they really focused on a lot of the dark corners, because there were a lot of dark corners along this area. And Grant and Jason from Ghost Hunters joined the program and reviewed some of the evidence. I don't know if I actually watched this episode or not. If I did, it's been a while, so I don't remember if they caught some evidence. But I'll take a wild guess and say, I bet they caught something. You know how these shows go, so I'm I'm sure they caught something. An anonymous person on the website Paranormal Stories related the following experience. We did a private hike of the wild Jinku section of the wall in 2012, and that's this wild wall that I'm talking about here. We also camped overnight in the isolated section there, just beside the wall. It was only myself, my wife, and the guide. The guide had his own tent and helped us set up ours, after which he prepared dinner. After eating and a bit of a chat, we went to sleep in our tent and the guide retired to his. Shortly afterwards, we heard someone walking around outside our tent. The sound of footsteps on rocks was unmistakable as it was otherwise very silent there. I quickly unzipped the tent thinking maybe it was the guide walking around, but I couldn't see anyone. I walked a few meters over to his tent to ask if he was still awake and he unzipped his tent before asking if I needed something. I told him we heard footsteps and asked if it was him and he said no. He'd been in the tent since after dinner. In the morning, he told us that other tourists had also heard footsteps over the rocks in the middle of the night. And that's one of the key things they hear. Here are these marching footsteps that are disembodied. So is that what these people heard? The Great Wall of China is one of the greatest wonders in the world. It was built on the backs of millions of people, and one has to wonder how many of those workers died and are buried somewhere along the wall. Is this why there are reports of apparitions? Is this energy captured from the historical conflicts that took place here? Is the Great Wall of China haunted? That is for you to decide. Well, thanks so much, Katrina, for suggesting this. I had never even thought of looking into the Great Wall of China. So very cool to uh, get to dig into the history there and to hear about some of the ghosts there. I wish there were a lot more stories out there. What always blows my mind is it seems like these locations that claim to be the most haunted in a certain state or area or what have you, they don't ever seem to have a whole lot of stories to go with them. It's just very generalized. Cold spots, apparitions, weird feelings blah, 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 but not a whole lot of one-on-one personal accounts. That's what I would like to start seeing more of at these places that are supposedly so incredibly haunted. Because if you want to convince me that a place is haunted, number one, and if you want to convince me that it's the most haunted, number two, I need to get a lot of experiences from a lot of different people. 
And I have a feeling many of you feel the same way. Love to have you guys check out the website at historygoesbump.com. And if you want to send me some feedback, you can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And I did get a couple of emails. First of all, we had Pat who suggested our moment in oddity, and he wanted to share some personal experiences that he had at Sarah's grave. I myself have seen a shadow of a tall man walk through the car headlights, had an overwhelming feeling of sadness, and for years was not able to set a foot past the threshold of the cemetery at night. It was like someone was blocking my path. The most frightening encounter was when my cousin, who's sensitive, wanted to check the area out. I walked in with her and she felt instant fear, cold, and a sense to get out. I, however, felt calm, warm, and invited. I felt like I was being directed along a path and was happily following it when my cousin yelled and ran to grab me and stop. I was about two feet from falling into a sunken gravesite. Didn't see it. Wouldn't have killed me, but could have caused injury. I've also been with groups of friends one of the nights I couldn't go in who were inside and treating the whole thing as a joke as teenagers do. They got spooked and ran back to the car, but the car wouldn't start. We had to get out and apologize to Sarah before it would start again. When we got home, there were handprints in the dust on the hood. (laughs) Oh my goodness, Pat. Well, thank you for sharing that. First of all, thank you for suggesting it as a moment in oddity. And then to have experiences that you've had personally to go with it. Wow. And that really is creepy to have a feeling like I'm not welcome in this cemetery because I honestly have never felt that at any cemetery. So if I ever was outside of a cemetery and had that feeling, I probably wouldn't go in because I'd be like, why do I feel that way? So normally you're getting that feeling. And then just that one time it says, hey, come on in join the party. Come on over here. Come on over here. Come on over here. And then you're almost in a grave. <laughs> I mean, It's like, gee, thanks for the invite, guys. So yeah, I think maybe you shouldn't hang out at that cemetery too much. And definitely, if you're going to do it, be respectful, because clearly, Sarah doesn't think it's cool. And I don't blame her after what she'd been through. It sounds like she doesn't really care for young men anyway. And if you're making a big joke out of it, she probably really doesn't like you. And then I heard from Valentina down in Australia. I have two daughters who are now four and six years old. My eldest, Rebecca, used to have two imaginary friends. Oh, no. A girl called Susie and a clown. Oh, my God. If they have an imaginary friend who is a clown, run quickly. (laughs) I never really thought anything of them other than an overactive imagination until we were sitting in my girl's bedroom one evening reading a book. Suddenly, Rebecca looked up at the door startled. She was four at the time. I asked what was wrong and she simply said, oh, nothing. Susie just came in and I was not expecting to see her. Creepy. So I'd be kind of like, where is Susie right now? And is she anywhere near me? And then, I don't know, I'm curious enough. I'd want to stick my hand into wherever Susie was and see if it was cold. At least it wasn't the clown. Then my youngest daughter, Anastasia, used to mention about a small boy coming by her window at night and asking her to let him in or go out with him and play. Oh my gosh. Anastasia said she shooed him as she was tired and wanted to sleep and eventually she did not mention him anymore. Although she still remembers him as sometimes it comes out in random conversations. Just a dream? I guess we will never know. Another night my partner was away on a course and I had the girl sleeping with me in the big bed as a friend of mine was visiting us with her daughter and they were sleeping in my daughter's bedroom. My kids have one of those little LED night lights which normally glows for half an hour and then it turns off. It has a switch on button on the top that needs to be pressed firmly. During that one night, Rebecca kicked the blanket off and woke up as she was cold. As she was settling and getting ready to sleep again, she woke me up and asked me if I could turn on the nightlight. The light was on my bedside table and she was on the opposite side of the bed. As I started to roll over towards the bedside table, I was facing the opposite way. The nightlight turned on by itself. Batteries were new and I cannot explain it. My daughter said, thank you, mom, but it wasn't me. Last but not least, my partner was coming home late from work one evening And when he came in, he said, thank you for opening the garage for me. That was good timing. I didn't open the garage as my keys and my remote control were nowhere near me. I was cooking and his remote control was in his car, keypad facing up on the passenger seat. I think maybe we had a friendly, helpful ghost. We've since moved into our new home. The other one was just a rental as we were in the process of building and no strange things have happened so far. So that's good news, Valentina. Sounds like nothing has followed you to the new house. That's one reason why I always like to buy new because then you're almost assured it's not going to be haunted. But as we found with some of these places that we've looked into, things do tend to attach to people and follow them places or attach to old things. And we have been putting some old things in this house, so I don't know. Hopefully everything stays calm around here. 
then I wanted to make a little announcement to you guys. How many of you listen to your music on Pandora? Some of you may be wondering, you know, when is Pandora going to finally figure out there's podcasts out there? Well, they have. They put out a press release today when I'm recording, which is November 13th. And it says, Pandora, the largest streaming music provider in the U.S. today, unveiled its podcast offering powered by the Podcast Genome Project, a cataloging system and discovery algorithm that uses a combination of technology and human curation to deliver personalized content recommendations. Beginning today, Pandora will roll out beta access to select listeners on mobile devices. Those interested in early access to the offering can sign up with general availability in the coming weeks. Well, I knew about this a couple of weeks ago because little old History Ghost Bump was asked to be part of the beta launch for Pandora. Now, most of the podcasts are not going to be available until December sometime. But if you want to get into this early access to Pandora and the beta, let me give you a link. It's pandorapodcastbeta.splashthat.com. Again, pandorapodcastbeta.splashthat.com. Dot com And splash that is all one word, S-P-L-A-S-H-T-H-A-T. This will get you on the list to get early access to podcasts on Pandora. So that was very exciting. Also, I hope you guys have checked out the Death Box podcast. That's my other podcast. I'm going to have another episode coming up here shortly. And thank you to all of you who have already reviewed it. I greatly appreciate that. Have some reviews from Apple Podcasts to share. First, we have Duckers33. Great show, five stars. I haven't stopped listening in a few days. Great job and keep up the hard work. Thank you so much. And AJO909, Spooky Fun, five stars. I love this podcast. Well, we love you too. Thank you. And Artist Rich, great podcast, five stars. History Goes Bump is a fantastic podcast that combines two of my loves, the paranormal and historical places. The host, Diane, does a great job researching famous reputed haunted sites and separating the historical facts from urban myth and legend. I especially appreciate this because it provides insight and context into the origins of the haunting. One of my favorites to listen to. Well, thank you, Rich. Greatly appreciate that. If you haven't left a review yet, please consider doing so. I want to thank you all for tuning in to this episode. I have been your host, Diane. You take care now. Bye-bye. Make sure you stick around. We have seven more eulogies coming right up. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We'd like to thank Greg Sullivan for upping his sponsorship. We will be moving him into a garden crypt. And welcome into the cemetery, Jessica Garcia. You are going to be getting a chest tomb. All right, Mort, take it away, big guy. Eulogies by Mort. Matthew Hirons did artwork for Upper Deck and Tops. I wonder if he ever drew a Triceratops. He loved Star Wars, Amanda and his kids. Now he has permanently shut his eyelids. Susie Doomy was a woman with a lot of sass. And she was a really fun-loving lass. Her beautiful home was located in Maine. But now her spirit is on another plane. Cindy Watt came from the land of cheese. During this time of year there I'd freeze. She enjoyed a good trip on the road. Now the cemetery is her abode. Jade Lewis lived near a spiritualist camp. Digging her grave gave me a cramp. She loved her garden, dogs and kitten. And now you can hear that her eulogy is written. Melissa Podacini had supported HGB since 2015. Rug poking and honey beehive were her scene. That's painting with wool if you don't know. I'll use her designs for the mausoleum window. Emily Ridner came from Michigan so cold. On pain of death, no person be so bold. 
She was a big fan of Shakespeare. I'll bury her in this crypt here. April Barber's kindred spirit was Zior. She loved a good story of supernatural lore. She was quite skilled in graphic design. She rests in a garden crypt, not a box of pine. Be sociable. Drop the chain rattling, neck biting, and shape shifting, and join us on Facebook and Twitter at History Goes Bump. Like the page and follow us.